Welcome to another edition of Cancer with Dr. Denise Ejo in partnership with Cross TV Africa. We want to thank you for joining us again and welcome you back. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you. And for those of you that are just that have been with us before we welcome you back and we hope you have a really nice time and it's the season of goodwill so let us now think about those who are going through cancer and the mental health challenges that they face as a result of the disease uh, thank you for joining us and let's go so today in the house we've got dr ralph emeka Ubulu. doc thank you for coming in and throughout the conversation i will refer to him as doc for the entire conversation um, and we'll take it from there. Doc, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome, and thank you for accepting to come on because we don't take people like you for granted. I'm not a medical doctor. I am just a doctor of book. So I want to say thank you for coming on. So let me give you a brief background of who Dr. Emeka is. He's a native of Aniocha South Local Government of Delta State and started his school in Washington, D.C., USA, where he grew up until 1978. He served as secretary of the Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria, Lagos chapter between 2012 and 2014, and then chairman between 2014 and 2016. He is currently actively engaged in psychiatry work in the UK and will be joining us to talk about cancer and the mental health, the psychiatry or psychology, whichever way we look at it. Um, he's going to guide us and tell us how we need to navigate. So doctor, welcome. And once again, I want to say thank you for engaging with us. We appreciate your time and we do not take it for granted. Um, so are we ready to go? Yes, we are. All right. So let's start with it. What is the role of a psychiatrist in the journey of a cancer patient? So a psychiatrist is um, meant to be part of what we call the psycho-oncology team, which is a specialized uh, field in psychiatry that deals with um, the psychological aspects of people who have cancer. So the, the, the psychiatrist is one member of a multidisciplinary team, which should include a psychologist, uh, counselors, and other therapists. And so the journey usually should start from the period when the person is going through the diagnostic process, because there are, there are four, there, you can say there are four stages. The first would be, of course, the person first experiences symptoms. And because uh, most cancers have non-specific symptoms, it's a journey before eventually someone says, oh, let's investigate this person for cancer. And so that's where the journey actually starts. Ideally, when the person is going through the diagnostic process, they should have psychological support because there's a lot of anxiety uh, provoking uh, exercise. The person is going through what we can call a grief reaction all through. That is, the person first could go into denial, okay? And then after that, some people will go into um, anger. They're angry angry at God, angry at things, you know, and then some will go into the stage of bargaining. And then that's when they bring in religion. Oh, if you, God, if you heal me, I will never do this. They're trying to negotiate with God. And then eventually they go into the stage of grief where they've now accepted that, well, this might just be what's happening to me. And then the final stage is acceptance. Now people could go through this in the diagnostic phase or actually in the treatment phase or in the recovery phase. So the, 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 the involvement of psychology and the psychiatric team is really crucial right from the beginning once the diagnosis has been made through the period of treatment, which can which comes with its own uh, psychological challenges as well, and then also the recovery phase. Uh, thank so you. That's it. You just woke me up now, you see? It's whenever things like, you ever start like this, it makes me very happy because you start, you start helping me. So I'm going to ask you, so is the role of the psychiatrist the same? It's not the same as the psycho psychiatrist and psychologist. They're not the same. No, it's not. So can you differentiate no. just short they, thing? They are not. So, so, yeah. Yeah, so the psychologist mainly deals with um, helping the person by way of non-medication approach. Okay, so talk therapy, 
um, uh, supporting them. And then if the person is going through mild periods of depression, just talk therapy. The psychiatrist gets involved when the person now needs medication for psychological issues they're going through. So the psychologist does not prescribe medication. The psychiatrist prescribes medication. So some people may only need the help of the psychologist, but if it's getting more severe, then the psychiatrist gets involved. Wow, that's, that is an eye-opener because you've just differentiated. So I've always had the psychologist in my journey as the cancer um, survivor. It's, it's interesting because, you know, when I talk to you uh, medics, you help us, you help me to be able to help all of us that go through it understand that it's not about just, there's no one, one size fits all and there's no particular um, process that works because exactly. I've had counseling um, during yeah. COVID and I think that was as a result of having my um, five year, you know, where you get to five year mark and you're trying to see, am I going to cross this line? Because apparently five years yeah. is a key line for cancer patients. And then I've just gone to book myself back into, psych into the cancer law and I've said to them, look, it's a, I'm not coping anymore. And so to all those who are going through cancer, please be like me, accept it when you're not coping. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, people say it's stigma, cancer already is stigmatized. So just take the best help you can. I'm going to ask you the next question. So at what stage of cancer treatment is a psychologist needed? Because based on what you're saying, we have different stages. There are different stages of the process, which is correct. I think almost all of us will say we have gone through two, maybe three of the five you mentioned. So at what stage do we really need to say, look, 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 it's getting hard. As a cancer patient or family members of a cancer patient looking at their relative or friend going through it and can't identify what is it they need to, where do they need to know they need help? Ideally, once someone is going through the diagnostic process, the psychologist and counselors should be involved because there is pre-diagnostic counseling that helps people go through the difficulties, the anxieties, you know, the sleepless night, the insomnia, all of that. That's where they should be involved. So you don't wait. It should be right through the, the beginning of the journey, through the diagnostic process, into the recovery process, through the treatment process. So it's from the very beginning. That's mm -hmm. the answer. Whoa, okay. Okay, okay. So what emotional um, disorders can a cancer patient develop? And I'm asking this, I'm trying to think to myself, would that be where we start crying? Is that the stage where we're yeah, so Yeah. Yeah, so so it's it's um the 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 common ones are anxiety. Okay? The illness anxiety, the person is worried. Uh, some will have uh, physical symptoms of anxiety, tremors, palpitations, and all of that. Then there's insomnia, sleeplessness. Okay, that's also one of the common conditions. And then you have depression. People go into clinical depression, where that's when they're crying, their mood is low, and all of that. And some may, at some point during that period, um, especially if they're not able to get to the stage of acceptance, some of them feel suicidal. And then um, also some have what's called adjustment disorder. Okay, this find it difficult to adjust to uh, the, the changes that come with the, con with the treatment and sometimes the condition itself. So it's, it's like you mentioned before, it's not one size fits all because um, the treatments, I, I mean, as you know, are various, uh, varied. Some will require radiotherapy, some chemotherapy, and some surgery. So these treatment modalities themselves come with it, their own challenges, which some people need support getting through. So the common things are rarely, very rarely, you have people experience things like a delirium or psychosis. Uh, where they're, they're, maybe you may hear voices or things that lose touch with reality. That's you, that may be related to the treatment or the progress of the cancer itself, it, if it's such that affects the brain. So these are the common ones. If it's such that affects the brain, 
Yes. So some some yeah, in the sense that you know some cancers are localized, especially if they're picked up early. So in those ones, and that's those are the ones that they will usually recommend surgery or targeted radiotherapy. Now, if so, for, unfortunately the person has maybe stayed in, stuck in the stage of denial and they haven't started treatment early and the cancer has now disseminated, has spread through the body, if one of the parts of the body that the cancer cells get to includes the brain, then the person could have more severe psychiatric conditions. That's what I mean by that. That's why early treatment is really crucial. Thank you. You know, you're bringing a reality to me, which I'm hoping that other people who are going through this will understand that they're not on the journey alone. And it's nothing, it's not just about them. Because, okay, I'm going to, let me put a question that's just come. You know, there's this challenge with, um, it's not my portion. Mm. And it's a very Afro-Caribbean statement um, where we bring in religion. And that is what you call denial. However, for us that go through it, is it really about denial or is it about all we can see is dying? Because no matter how we want to be politically nice or correct about it, cancer patients live in the fear of dying. And it's a reality that we have to accept. So in your in your from what you're saying, what how do you think we should? Yes, uh, you see, it's 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 those the processes, the stages that I mentioned, they are natural. There's hardly anyone who will not go through those stages. It, it's normal, but it's being stuck in those stages. That's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the denial it, it comes naturally. Nobody wants to immediately accept. But will, should you stay stuck there? If you stay stuck there, then that's where your dread, which is dying, becomes a, a, more, a greater likelihood because you've not started treatment. I, I remember um, when, when, as a young doctor, one of the when I was not into psychiatry, so um, we're doing all, all 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 fields then as a young medical officer, and I, I had a cancer patient who had breast cancer. And she told me she was so she was in this ward because um, her cancer had um, had spread and she didn't come for treatment early, and so they thought she had now developed stroke, so she went to a stroke ward. Now, whilst there, I was uh, of course as a young doctor, we would administer the medication and all of that, and so she told me she had gone through these stages. She had now gotten to the stage of acceptance, and she said that she it's funny to her that. The fear, just what you said, is always, oh, am I, is this going to kill me? Am I going to die? But she was in that stroke ward and saw people who didn't have cancer, people who were younger than her, who had stroke and died right there. And she said, so she's living, she's alive, fearful of death, but these people who had suddenly had high blood pressure, had stroke and died, they, you know, so death can come. But it's the risk that's, I mean, it, 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 it is now the difference. Yes, we know that there's a there's slightly, I mean, there's a greater likelihood when you have some conditions compared to others, but everyone's in the fear of dying. So it's how you address that in terms of doing what you should do, which is receive treatment. That's what reduces your risk. That's what reduces the likelihood. So, so to stay stuck in denial, you're only increasing the likelihood of dying. And thank you for that nice starting because it's 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 quite relaxing when when I'm not stressed thinking about what's what's what am I supposed to be doing here. So how can a diagnosis of cancer affect the social life of a patient? And this is important. So I'm going to let you start, and then I'm going to add to it. Yeah. The, so the diagnostic process involves. Again, it, it, it depends on the type of cancer that is suspected that the person has. So that will guide the how invasive, that is how, how um, intrusive the diagnosis is. Some may require surgical you know, diagnostic procedures. Some may just require blood tests. 
Some may require x-ray. That's, that's difficult for a lot of people. And, and, and people go through emotional challenges, anxiety, that, that's called illness anxiety. Should I, should I not? Should I go through this? Or what about, it? and sometimes the procedures themselves come with their own risk. Okay, so that's also things that the people have to deal with. Oh, is this is is it this procedure? Is it worth it? Should I go through it? Not forgetting that the cost, especially in our society where people have to pay out of pocket, that costs a lot, and it can drain people doing several tests. You have sometimes you have to journey to different centers from where you were far from where you live, and that takes its own toll on your finances, your family. Okay, your, your caring role, if you, you have children and things like that. So these are things that the person is having to go through. So beyond the illness itself, there are associated factors, stressors that can affect one psychologically. And that's why the need for support, organizations, systems in place that support people, which unfortunately we don't, we don't have enough of, but these are things that we have. Ah, Doc, you know, you hit a lot of key points for me going from this point. Um, and I think this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Because one of the first things that I picked up from the World Cancer Congress 2022 was when I had to be asking about our finances. A lot of people do not realize that statistically, globally, cancer patients become broke in two years. So they lose their homes, they lose their means of livelihood, they become poor from a very comfortable place. All of a sudden, cancer has hit them. And yes, you are right. Living in where, for instance, we come from, it is why we hear stories from survivors about having to take what they call half cocktails and this cocktails. And you're wondering, what, are, what is all this? The disease is... I'm, um, I get sad every time I think about it because somehow it's like our lives don't matter. It's a shame to have to say it, but if we don't have the money, we don't, it's just, that's it, you know, and it's sad to accept, but it's a reality that we have to be aware of. And with this, therefore, comes emotional disorders, which you then have to treat. Am I correct? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Okay. And how would you now go about that? Because a lot of it is emotional. It's, it's how we feel. I mean, when I found myself last week with my, my team and I was told my chemo had to stop because it was affecting another organ, I, I woke up and realized that, huh, what does that mean? And no matter what, I'm still human. And no matter how strong you want to be, you're still human. You've got emotions and you've got to get past them. That's it. And that's why the support is key, because there's no prescription. There's no, I mean, that fits all, you know, so it comes with the circumstances. And so that's why it's like you need someone to hold your hand through the journey because there could be different turns. Some people's journeys are different. And uh, that's where, that's where, you know, the uh, one, one other thing that's really important, why it's, it's, it's key to, I know it's difficult, but to be hopeful because there's a lot of where we are in terms of cancer treatment today is not where we were 20 years ago. It's not where the world would be five years, 10 years down the line. There is constant research because we recognize it's a big problem. Uh, but the thing, so one should be hopeful, first of all, that yes, you can beat that five year line. You can beat the cancer. Because if you don't go with that mindset and you already give up, then you won't see the, you won't you won't get there because you've given up. And this is not just with the person who has the cancer, but with the people who are treating them. Because we have um ju not just the person who you said the, the word cancer what comes to mind is for a lot of people is death. You understand? Am I dying or mm -hmm. asleep? It's not just the person who has the cancer, but even people who treat them. Some people, that's why we talk about the, the, the need to train those who are treating people because the body language of some people is like, oh, well, what's the point? 
And if that's the body language of the person who's supposed to be giving you hope, who's supposed to be treating you, then that's a problem. So that, and that's where the whole stigma is. The stigma isn't just the person who has the cancer, but even people who treat the person who has cancer. Some of them feel stigmatized. Okay, they make you feel that this is this is a, is a waste of resources, which is which is wrong, which is a very wrong a message. Which um, some people not by not necessarily by what they say, but the body language. And if you're passing that body language to someone who has cancer, then what do you want the person to feel? So that's why it's that's where the role of psycho oncology services come into play. Unfortunately, we don't have much of that in our country. And that is a key issue that we have. And we have to yes. accept. Yes. Yeah, because if you look at it, and I, I look at it from, I'm very realistic, which you appreciate, um, about this challenge, because we are stigmatized, no matter what the world says. And I think the world is now learning to understand that cancer patients are stigmatized, because even in our own Nigerian culture, there's already an issue once you once somebody knows a member of a family has had cancer you find people saying oh, you can't marry into that house because that person they will give you cancer as if cancer is moved from one person and that advocacy really has played a big role in that i'm going to ask you one question that uh, it's not so much or is it about how people cancer patients access psychiatry and is it a very expensive access for people who, you know because we already have to pay the kaki bill we have to pay our transport around we have to pay all these blood tests we have to pay yeah we have a lot to pay psychiatry as well is that also part of the costed bills that we have to pay especially in nigeria it's it adds to the cost uh, i mean that's i won't i mean we, we can't deny that it's but it you now have to look at the cost benefits of it being in a better state of mind improves your response to treatment for the cancer so therefore if even if it's going it's going to add to the cost on the long run it's more beneficial if your mental well-being is better okay is in a better place you're more likely to respond better to it whether it's chemotherapy whether it's um, radiotherapy, all the treatment modalities, which means you're likely to live longer, which means your quality of life is likely to improve. So that's where the issue is. Would you want to not do that because the immediate cost now is, is, is a challenge, whereas in the long run, it would make you better. So no, without a doubt, it, it would add to the cost. But I can tell you that it's less expensive compared to the other treatment modalities. Now, how do you get access to it? Right now in Nigeria, I mean, most cancer centers or treatment centers do know how to reach a psychologist or psychiatrist because most of them, one, are largely situated in teaching hospitals or multi-specialty centers. So usually what, 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 we, what we're trying to do is work with the oncologists okay, the radiotherapists and all the others to get them to spot signs that will alert them to the need to, oh, I think you should see a psychologist. Oh, I think you should see a psychiatrist. So all the, all the person needs to do is ask them. If they've not spotted it, ask them, do you have access to a psychiatrist or psychologist I could see? Do you have access to a psychology team that can support me? ask that's what i would say i was just about to ask you my actual big last question give me three things that will help so uh, the three things i'm going to try and narrow it down i want one for the government to do for us because honestly with like you said the cost implication is is one of the most heartbreaking which which is why statistics is saying 70 to 80 percent of people with cancer in developing countries um, are more likely to die, especially places like Nigeria than anywhere else, as against like England where 70 to 80% are more likely to live. Um, give me three points that we want to take away that we hope people will hear. One for a survivor, one for the government, 
And the government is the first one, is the major one, and one for um, the medics, the people that care for us. Three things that we so, need to get right. For the government, I would say they should expand the national health insurance scheme to include cancer treatment. That would go a long way in easing the financial burden. It is not it is not covered currently. If they can't get cancer treatment covered, at least to an extent, on, in the National Health Insurance Scheme, they should ensure that psychological treatment is covered. So that's what I would ask the government to do. On the on the on the part of the survivor, I would say, during this festive period, try some mindfulness. You can go on YouTube, on the internet, and see short, you know, talks or trainings on mindfulness. Mindfulness will really help anyone who's a survivor. Okay. Then for the people who treat them, I will say mind your body language be psychologically aware and psychologically minded even though you're not a psychologist or psychiatrist do some training in the emotional disorders that are associated with uh, 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 cancers it will help you to provide better care to people you're treating so those are the three tips i'll give Thank you very, very much for your time. I am very, very, I've run out of a lot of time, but uh, let's see how we'll get all this together for the general populace so that we can actually learn. It is a season of Christmas uh, and the new year. And I want to say to all our viewers, we really hope you have a lovely, lovely Christmas. And I will be speaking to you before the end of the year when we will also look at other things that are important for you as cancer patients. To our uh, special guest today, Doctor, I want to appreciate you, appreciate your time and everything and the time that you spent um, guiding us. And you will see this program on. And everyone else, uh, you can follow us on the Comod Cancer Foundation. We have it on the web. We have a website. That's the name. We have it on um, we have a YouTube channel and this video will be out there and all other videos that allow you to uh, engage and find the facts about what's going on because there are always medics or patients that are talking, not um, qualified medics that have recognized, that are recognized in Nigeria. So don't worry about it. The facts you're going to get are from professionals who are specialists in this field. Um, you find um, snippets and stuff on our Facebook page, our YouTube Follow us, share, and um, click on the share button. Also, also subscribe because together we get the message out. We save lives. I hope that we will see you again before the end of the year. And I wish you all a lovely Merry Christmas in advance. Please pop in and visit somebody who's going through cancer. Just have a good laugh um, and eat your love rice or whatever and just be happy with them. Have a lovely Christmas and thank you for joining us.